Opening program parameters. Player code established. Welcome, Welcome. to the program. A production of the Metal Robot.com. Nobody cares about the robot gimmick. Just start the fucking show already. Ugh. Humans are determined assholes. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. Initializing playback. Welcome to MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast, the podcast about all things metal and everything in between. The Satanic Panic. Yes, I'm still talking about this. So long as this continues to be a trending thing, I will milk the shit out of the insanity of religious nut jobs like the heathen that I am. And joining me tonight is fellow heathen Alan Cross of the Ongoing History of New Music podcast. He has a lot to say about this, and you'd be dumber than a film studio using the wrong band in a music documentary to not listen to him. Speaking of, in the Metal News recap, Steel Panther on the cover of a Motley Crue documentary, and who's the most successful touring metal act of the past 40 years? I'd tell you now, but that would spoil Metallica surprise. But coming up in a few short moments, that new Amana Marth album, a request from you, and more from this week's new release. Releases. All this and more, so let's not waste much more time and let's get into the show. I'm Tom McKay and this is the Metal Robot Podcast. You're listening to MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. It has begun, Tom McKay, the Metal Robot Podcast. Like I said in the beginning, we have a jam-packed show for you today. Now, I know some of you are thinking, mostly Canadians are thinking, how the hell did you get Alan Cross on your show? Well, (laughs) you know, it's funny, I still have no idea. I sent an email one night saying, good evening, I want to talk to you about uh, on my show about the Satanic Panic, given your resume as a music nerd who knows his shit. Look forward to your reply. Send. Honestly, wasn't expecting anything. Next morning... Email from Alan Cross. No joke! You should have seen my face! It was priceless! But I had a great time talking to him about about all this, and I can't wait till you hear it coming up later in the show. But first, let's get into the reviews. Three new releases, one request that I completely missed from last week. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, If you have any albums you want me to cover on future episodes of the podcast, send me an email, tmckay at themetalrobot.com. That's T-M-C-K-A-Y at themetalrobot.com. Or reach it on my socials, Facebook and Twitter at themetalrobot, Instagram at the dot metalrobot. Use the hashtag metalrobotpodcast so I can find you. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at what we've got. Ah, yes, the great heathen army has been called to battle by the legendary Amon on Marth. I, I don't know why I went like half Scottish for that. Like, like, apart from Gerard Butler in How to Train Your Dragon, there's little to no correlation here. Anyway, 12th full length from the Swedish Vikings, and it goes hard. About as hard as any Amon and Marth album usually does, with a well-thought-out story, strong gutturals, and crushing drums that destroy your insights upon prolonged listening. Of course, drums and vocals alone don't give us the sound that we're hearing on this album. Bring in the guitars and bass, and this album truly takes you on a journey across the seas on a mission of conquest with with your heathen army and keeps that intrigue throughout. I've so far listened to this at least more than once and it fails to get boring for even a second for me. Though of course that doesn't change the underlying fact that this isn't different from anything that we've heard from this band before. Yeah, as much as I like to praise this album, this is yet another Amon album, which to be fair, after 12 albums, you do start to run out of new things to do. But aha, here's the thing about this one trick it's still fucking awesome. Would I want a new sound and a brand new album from this band? Dear Metal Robot listener, you know I fucking do. I've slashed bands apart like a coked up cat to a curtain for less. But with Amana Marth though, you can't help but still enjoy the music given here. The pure guttural vocal performance with dark and sinister sounding leads and riffs and great sounding drum work more than make up for the lack of new material. In fact, 12 albums and 30 years later, these guys don't sound like they've even aged a single day on those Viking waters. 
it's not the best MDM record of the year because we've heard this before, but I'll be damned if this doesn't pop up in my ears from time to time just for the pure adrenaline-fueled, adventure-laced good time. 14 out of 15, you want a good Viking story with great melodic death metal? The Great Heathen Army awaits your arrival. Carrion Vale's Abhorrent Obsessions is another tech death record in the most tech death of tech death ways in tech and death. And given my previous tech death review on this show, that might sound bad, but let me go further with this one. First off, throughout this album is a blast of sonic pushing power and intensity. There isn't a moment on this album where it isn't flooring it on the gas and cranking the dial past even 11. This is cocaine on cocaine. I'm of course referring to the drummer, and you'd be remiss to think otherwise. Which, again, can be described as any tech death band in existence, and yeah, that isn't terribly different here. Though here, there are a few more standout moments compared to others, and these guys do know how to break up the monotony of the riff after riff style of songwriting that this genre has become littered with. Every once in a while, it feels like that style, but further analysis determines actual songwriting is going on here rather than the usual Duh, I have sweaty fingies. Now, for most tech death bands, the problem that they have is that they are in a circle jerk of constant carbon copying of everybody else in the circle jerk. While that isn't terribly different here with Abhorrent Obsessions, these guys at least understand how to keep things semi-interesting. Every tech death band does this thing, and once I mention this, it'll be impossible for you not to notice going forward where they will just write a cool riff, repeat it once or twice, then afterward will write another cool riff, repeat it a couple of times, and keep that going with more riffs until the three, four, five minute mark when the song ends. But those riffs have no real correlation with each other. There's no theme to them, nor is it interesting to listen to after a while. Yeah, three minutes of that is tolerable, but once you get to the 47 minute mark, you start to doze off faster than Ambien on chloroform. Yes, that still happens here, but guess what? They break up the monotony. Getting tired of a nonsense shredding riff? Let's add in a less intense riff, pull back on the blast beats, and give some groove. Too much of the chromaticism? Let's add a clear chord progression with a choir in support. Heck, afterwards, we'll even give you an intense riff that actually has clear direction. Oh, is the entire album of intense fast screams and growls getting old? They can clean sing too! Do enough different things every so often, even if every single one isn't unique or interesting, and you have an experience that is interesting enough to keep the listener engaged. That's the point. You don't need to make the change up the best thing on the fucking planet, nor do you need to make every single riff the best thing on the planet, but give the listener something to latch onto every once in a while so that they can stay engaged. And these guys do a great job of doing that. 13 and a half out of 15, seriously worth picking up I think. I'm curious to know if they'll expand their sound further in the future, but we'll have to wait and see what happens then. Primitive Vice's debut album Savage Sonic Sermons was requested by the band's other guitarist and vocalist, Willie Baines. Not a shot against you, Willie, but dude, you have a second guitarist and vocalist. How am I supposed to tell you apart? By your looks? But I appreciate your email, though. So Primitive Vices is an Edinburgh-based metal band going for a high-on-fire, early Mastodon type of vibe with their sound. Basically, it's stoner metal, but with a bit of THC for spice. Bravo! Now, as mentioned, Willie isn't the only vocalist. In fact, he's one of three in the band. Do I know what kind of vocals he does and what everyone else does? Hell no. Honestly, I've only really heard, I think, two types of vocal styles, so unless there's one main and two backup, or two main and one backup, there's no point in trying to figure out who's who. But those vocal styles have some real talent behind them, from low guttural shouts to more mid-range shouts, and I think I heard rapping in there a second ago, but in a stoner metal album, how well do you think that went? Will the real Slim Shady please stop smoking? Of course, vocals aside, the rest of the band isn't doing too bad either. The bass is doing a lot of what the guitars are doing, but they add a bit of heft to the pummeling riffs given on display. Also, those drums are fucking annihilated. Yes, I used the past tense, annihilated, rather than annihilating, because after this album's recording session was up, those drums must have looked worse than Sid that one time he did a Slipknot show.
If you didn't get that, your own damn fault. Look up Sid Slipknot Injury and you'll be scrolling for days. The album is fairly decent in terms of length, not too long, about 47 minutes, but they use every minute of it to give you some great sounding stoner metal. It can feel a bit long in some places, particularly when the transition from song to song isn't as clear, but for a debut, there's a lot of potential going on here. Give these guys a chance to add a bit of refinement in some of the techniques and songwriting, but lots to love and lots to get into. 13 out of 15, this is a band you'll want to keep your ear to the ground on for sure. Dub War, Westgate Under Fire. What the hell did I stumble upon? Punk? Metal? Reggae? The hell kind of cocktail did the bartender give me? I just asked for a Diet Coke. Also, funny thing, this is the band's first album in 26 years, and you thought Tool's release schedule was fucked. Sure, they spent at least 15 of those years broken up, but still, fans must have been clawing at the bit for a new album. Full disclosure, by the way, I can't really compare this new album to anything they've done before, as I haven't heard anything from these guys before, so this review is more gonna be from a newcomer's perspective, so if you are not a newcomer, bear with me on this one. What am I greeted with? an odd yet oddly satisfying release. First up, if you didn't know this was classified as metal, you'd actually be forgiven. With the stuff I talked about in this episode, I almost questioned if they were in the same hemisphere. Yes, I could tell the influence was there, but the actual placement on the spectrum was almost impossible for me to tell. But then I realized, wait, why do I care? I mean, metal is more attitude than actual sound anyway, so fuck it, let's talk about some reggae fusion. And on top of the powerful opening track of Black C -C Command, <laughs> the entire album, <laughs> that's so fucked. The entire album oozes punk energy with almost fun vibes thanks to the reggae influence. Speaking of that first song though, holy shit, that was a great track. Punk energy with the reggae soundscape? Shit, I was dancing like an idiot during that one. No, seriously, I was doing that thing where I was aggressively moving my head with my body side to side with the stupidest grin on my face to the beat of Black Man. Front to back, it's a great sounding album though. That sounds so vastly different from anything I've heard in a long time. Tough subject matters to cover for sure, but necessary as well. And despite those subject matters, this was a fun, punk-fueled, reggae-vibing metal album that you seriously can't get anywhere else. I seriously, honest to God, I challenge anybody to name any band that has done something similar to what Dub War is doing right now. Actually, maybe don't do that. There's a 15-year gap in between this band existing. Copycats totally could have come up during that time, so... Hmm, 14 out of 15, go get it and have a great time. And that's it for reviews. Surprisingly, lots of great stuff this week, including some stuff I didn't think I would have found otherwise. Great stuff this week. Let's hope next week keeps up that streak. Though, now that I said that, we're going to get the next Lulu, I guarantee it. Uh, knock on wood. Or, you know what, forget I say anything. Like I said earlier, though, send your emails to tmckay at themetalrobot.com, or you can reach it on my socials for any albums you would like covered on the podcast or on the main YouTube show. Coming up, Alan Cross joins us to talk about the satanic panic and how it never actually went away. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. Let's open the gates. For Astaroth has risen. And the demon has gone core. Wait, the story is the demon has gone core? I don't get it. Just wait for the drop. What the fuck? From the ashes of Ascendance, Astaroth is born again. Into the world of Sam Astaroth with his new song, Demon Core. Available on all streaming. Music video available on YouTube. Links in the podcast description. Looking to stay up to date on all things Metal Robot? No, not really. What? Why? I don't listen to metal. How are you listening to this podcast? I thought it was Joe Rogan. <laughs> We're going to pretend he didn't say that. Follow the show wherever you tread on social media. Facebook and Twitter. At The Metal Robot. Instagram. At The Dot Metal Robot. You can even join the Metal Robot Discord server. We have fun there. Links to all of that and more in the description of this podcast. Follow now. You're listening to MRP, The Metal Robot Podcast. 
All right, welcome back. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. Last episode, amongst the fun stuff that we talked about from video games, chiptunes, metal, and Dave Mustaine's inability to not be an asshole, I did a 10-minute piece on the Satanic Panic. We talked about its history, its origins, why it was a problem for innocent people, including metalheads and rock fans, and why those who want to bring it back may want to reconsider that position. But that was focused on North America, which, as a Canadian podcast, has to be the most North American thing I could have done. And while you don't see much of that today, at least not in the way the 80s saw it, look beyond the continental US and you see that the satanic panic still exists. The biggest example being our same, an Iranian metal band that fled the country because they were convicted by the Islamic government of being a satanic metal band, despite no evidence supporting that. Though they did have skulls on their t-shirts, and as my guest briefly quipped on his website, skulls equals Satan, apparently. But obviously that's a more extreme case in a more extreme part of the world. Back stateside in the Western world, where that couldn't possibly happen again in these modern times, can it happen again? If so, what would it look like? Also, is there a connection, if even a small one, between the panic of the 80s and modern day QAnon. Lots to discuss here, and to do to help with this, I'm sitting down with Alan Cross. Yeah, that may have picked up a few ears there. Canadian broadcaster, music writer, journalist. He's the website. Uh, the website is a journal of musicalthings.com. He's the host of the ongoing History of New Music radio show on 101.2.1, 102.1, The Edge out of Toronto, and the subsequent podcast that you can check out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your favorite podcast. The guy really knows his shit. So I figured it'd be better to talk to him about all of this than to go on another 10-minute drunkenly written rant. Alan, it's an honor to have you on the show. Welcome. How are you doing today? I'm uh, I'm decent. Thank you for asking. That's good to hear. So um, I did a lot uh, in the intro talking about your 20-page resume. Is there anything I may have missed that you want to share? Or? Uh, no, that's good. We'll just stop there because otherwise it begins to sound a little bit uh, overwhelming. Even I can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here for hours is essentially what you're saying. Is that what you're saying? Basically? Uh, pretty much, yes. Okay. All right. So let's get right into it then. In the last episode, I talked about the Satanic Panic's history and why we shouldn't bring it back today. But when looking at some of the stuff that you've actually covered on your website, including uh, QAnon's conspiracy of soul snatching at Astro World, yeah, remember that shit, um, and a Tennessee metal festival being accused of opening a portal to hell. The Satanic Panic never really went away, did it? No, it's actually been around uh, for a lot longer than most people realize. I mean, if you go all the way back to Plato, if mm. you go back to some of the early uh, members of the Catholic Church, you know, they've been saying that certain types of music um, are immoral for a variety of reasons. You know, maybe it's mm -hmm. a little bit too titillating between the legs, or maybe it uh, conjures thoughts of uh, impurities. I mean, there, there are a couple of uh, you know people who are now sainted who uh, were very worried about some of the hymns that were being played in church because it's like ah, a little too arousing, a little too stimulating. Right. And then the Catholic Church, of course, came out against something called uh, the uh, Devil's Tritone, which was, uh, yes. think of Blur's, um, uh, what is it, Boy, uh, Park Life or Girls and Boy. One of them, it was a Blur song. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's just a weird sounding tone that's mm -hmm. used a lot in, in a variety of songs. Uh, variety of songs, including a bunch of metal songs. And just oh, yeah. Because it sounded weird, it must be something that, uh, that, 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 that's conjure Satan. Yeah, that is like it, metal, metal heads especially know what a tritone is. You listen to anything like Cannibal Corpse or even non metal, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Page. Uh, I forget the name of the song. Purple Haze, I think. No, that's not the right one. Is I think it? Purple Haze is actually a devil's tritone too. Yeah. Yeah. Like the intro guitar riff. I know yes. like, yes. So like, yeah, we know what the tritone is. That, that actually is a great example. And then of course, when we get into the rock and roll world, actually, when we get into the jazz world in the mm -hmm. early 1900s, people were saying, well, this is obviously, you know, devil's music because listen to how provocative it is and look at how it makes women dance, how it makes men act and some of the levitious uh, lyrics of the blues records that started coming out in the 1920s. Oh, again, it must be Satan at work. Robert Johnson learned how to play guitar by yes. right? selling his soul to the devil at the crossroads, and <sighs> on and on it goes. Then rock and roll comes along, and then, well, this has to be immoral, because look at Elvis Presley and the way he shapes his hips. Look at Jerry Lee Lewis and the way he acts. Look at 
uh, little Richard, and you know, he's obviously this homosexual <laughs> who is a, a terrible, horrible human being that needs to be suppressed. Mm -hmm. And this continues, uh, well, right up until today, really. But back in the 80s, I, I assume you were around during that time period, correct? Or did oh, yes. Okay, so uh, was it was it as bad as many of us seem to be remembering it? Yeah, it was it was weird. Um, there were evangelical types who had come out against any kind of rock music. Mm -hmm. Metal was their their main target, but any kind of rock music was fair game. And they began looking for subliminal messages and things like Stairway to Heaven and uh, various Black Sabbath songs uh, that uh, you know were supposed to encourage young people, influence young people to doing terrible, horrible things, including killing themselves. I mean, you know, Sabbath had the song Suicide Solution, or was that, I was Ozzy, Suicide Solution. Um, uh, yeah, w wasn't Judas Priest uh, thrown into mix of there as well? They, they were, and, and uh, Rob Halford actually had to testify in court. He was subpoenaed and, and, and had to be a witness in this particular case because uh, the defense or the prosecution wanted to cross-examine him about, you know, you're under oath. Uh, you have to tell us if you put these messages in your music. And, and, and Rob's on the stand going, what are you talking about? It's, no, it, it, it was never a thing. It, it began with some of these, um, from what I remember, and I stand to be corrected on this, I, I remember there were some of these TV shows where you had these evangelists trying to raise money. And they would mm -hmm. try to whip up all kinds of panic about things that were happening in society and see how we're all going to hell and see how the end times are coming. Uh, you know, look at what your kids are listening to. Uh, you know, it's it's all about drugs. It's all about sex. It's all about summoning Satan. Uh, I mean, Art Linkletter, for example, if you go back to the... Uh, 1000 homo dj song that features trent reznor and, and uh, al jorgensen in ministry it starts off with a altered voice and that's art linkletter talking about uh you know the kids and their music and how they're supposed to turn on and drop out and put acid in your veins mm -hmm. it was a, it was a very weird time and i remember if you go on youtube you can find uh, this clown that played stairway to heaven backwards and then he found allegedly this message in Robert Plant singing backwards about how, mm -hmm. you know, sweet Satan, that, that kind of stuff. It, it, just nuts. Oh yeah. No, it was a, it was definitely a weird time. And, and we know this was, uh, this wasn't only happening in North America. I mean, today, as we were talking about, as I mentioned with, uh, our same, uh, from Iran, um, and including in the nineties with the rise of Norwegian black metal, that was a big thing that was happening over there. Uh, but was this already a worldwide issue or was the rest of the world reacting to what was going on in America? I'm not entirely sure. Everything is interconnected. Uh, the black metal, death metal thing in, in Scandinavia took on a life of its own. I'm not sure exactly how serious some mm -hmm. of those guys were. I mean, there were some that were deadly serious. Oh, not. yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, burning down a church is mm -hmm. not something that you do, you know, for fun. This is something that you, you know, genuinely believe in. Well, unless you ask those guys. In that case, I'm sure they got a kick out of it. Um. Oh, I'm sure they did. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sure they did. Uh you know, it's it's whenever society decides that it's gone too far, uh, there are always going to be elements that are going to want things to snap back to the way, you know, the good old days, the mm -hmm. God fearing ways. Uh, or if people want to you know, create a panic so they can raise money or raise attention, uh, you know, metal is something that they always point to because it's loud, it's heavy, it's screamy, it's intense. And, and, you know, just listen to it. How could it not be evil when, you know, it's not necessarily the case. And you, you do have bands that, that flirt with that sort of imagery. And there are some that are deadly serious about it. But at the same time, relax. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't think that there is, if anybody has ever actually summoned Beelzebub uh, in a song. Uh, so he's actually appeared in front of anybody. Uh, but it, it is a worldwide thing. It comes and goes in cycles and ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, I, I follow it quite a bit. Uh, the Middle East is a particularly bad place because of the religious yes. sensibilities there. Uh, Indonesia is also another place where things get a little weird from time to time. Malaysia mm -hmm. also as well. They're very suspicious of Western music and especially loud, aggressive uh, um Music, uh, for example, Lincoln Park once had to play a show in Kuala Lumpur, and they had to get all kinds of special permission from the authorities. 
And when they did finally play, the band had to play sitting down and the audience had to sit down and uh, there was no jumping up and down. And uh, everybody just had to sit there and watch Lincoln Park like they were some sort of chamber orchestra because, well, perhaps that would keep the devil at bay. Yeah, I think Sepultura, uh, when they when they were traveling around that area of the world, I can't remember which country, they saw the same thing. And they, like you, were like, I talk about like, that was weird. Like that was off compared to, you know, where, you know, when they're performing in Brazil or, or North America or Europe. That is definitely, I'd say, yeah, you go over there. And do you think that's still happening or do you know? Uh, oh, do you no, know? It's, it's, it's definitely happening. Still it happening? Is, it, it is definitely happening. Uh, you know, I, I spend uh, a fair amount of time or I had spent a fair amount of time before COVID in Southeast Asia. And I ran across it constantly. There are some uh, islands of liberalism, um, you know, Thailand, for example, Philippines, um, Taiwan. I mean, they're, they're, you know, fairly relaxed about this sort of thing. But you get into some of the more conservative parts of Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, you get into uh, most of Malaysia. Uh, and, and you can see that things get pretty weird. People are, are, are uh, you know, they have a long history of persecuting any kind of rock and roll musicians. Uh, there was a time in Indonesia, for example, where the president ordered that the police stop anybody with long hair and give them a haircut immediately because obviously they were a terrible influence on society and probably really? converting with Satan. So uh, that that has passed, but I mean, there are still quite a few bands. I mean, I've been following some Indonesian metal bands for for a bit, and uh, they're they're able to play, but you know they can't play everywhere, and they're often mm -hmm. harassed because of, of what they do. Uh, I think that probably the worst gig in the world is to be. A woman in an all metal female. Oh, no, oh a yeah. Woman in an uh, all female band from the Middle East. Oh. Uh, you know, I've got a book here someplace that talks about some of these women who have been brave enough to be in metal bands. And, you know, the amount of, of, of harassment that they get. You know, and you, you talked about bands that, that get imprisoned or, or beaten and flogged because. Just because they're music. Yeah, no, that that is something that we still they still see uh, across the world, and uh, we saw a little bit of, of it in North America back in the eighties, and uh, I think a little bit in the West Memphis Three in the nineties. Um, but I, like, yeah, that seems to be happening more ex in the extreme parts of the world. Uh, I think in Jerusalem, I believe there's still, a, or like uh, in Israel, there's still a lot of places that are very, it's very not safe, I guess, to be a metalhead or um, in a metal band. Would you say that's the case in that part of the world or is it mostly a bit further east? Uh, well, it, it's, uh, I would say places like, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, mm. Iraq, uh, uh, in Dubai, to a certain extent, Abu Dhabi, certain extent. Uh, but, you know, the one thing about metal is that it, it grows like a weed. You know, you mm -hmm. give it a little tiny bit of soil and it will explode into something. Metal and goth are the two biggest musical subcultures in the world, you know, mm -hmm. outside of pop music. And uh, there's there's just no stopping it. There's, there's no mm -hmm. way that you can prevent it from happening because... It's good music and it feels good and it's cathartic and it's all that sort of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of, of I, I was in a record store in, uh, in Bali once and uh, uh, they did have a section mm -hmm. for metal, but it was closed off to kids. You had to be of a certain age to go and actually browse through those records. Actually, they were cassettes mm -hmm. uh, because, well, I mean, you know, if you were a child, it's obvious that you were susceptible to some kind of uh, satanic influence. It, it's, it's just, a, I've never really understood it. We're seeing it a little bit yeah. again today because, um, you know, America seems to be turning into this white Christian nationalist theocracy. And of course you need a boogeyman for everything. And right. uh, metal music is, is one of those things that uh, it provides a, an easy target. Mm -hmm. Now, on that note, I might get a, a bit of flack from my listeners on this one, but fuck it. Uh, in the last episode, uh, that I made a point to clarify that uh, even back in the day, it was it may not have been all Christian conservatives during that time period that were part of the problem, because even if they did believe the satanic ritualistic abuse was happening, they weren't harassing, not all of them at least, were harassing or jailing the wrong people. But to build off of that, as we've as we look beyond North America and we've looked at the world all over the place, this what this isn't just a purely Christian satanic panic, at least not not around the world. Is that the case in North America? It's uh, 
all it's almost exclusively uh let's say all kinds of religious conservatives mm-hmm. if you are a religious a conservative religious person uh chances are you cannot reconcile that with um with, with certain types of music, certain lifestyles, uh, certain attitudes. It doesn't matter what, what creed you subscribe to. No, there's, there, there, there are, are uh, pockets of resistance to, to this music in all religions. And again, it has to do with the fact that this seems rebellious. It's, it's against the status quo. It's, it's people speaking their mind. It's, it's about individualism. It's about, you know, all those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, if you are, you know, part of a, a very conservative culture, the, Look at this as a threat. You look at this as something that is trying to dismantle your world order, and that cannot be allowed. That's a good point, and that's why I wanted to make sure I made that uh, point, because it seems very easy for especially metalheads to point directly at a single religion rather than looking at the bigger picture, because this is... Uh, It's it's, it's widespread. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I mean, even within, you know, specific religions let's say judaism or christianity or or, uh or islam or whatever you want to choose uh you will find pockets that are tolerant and then you will find small pockets that are intolerant let's let's again remember this is often a reaction against the attitudes and music of youth now you know in the 1950s you know in the southern united states and this was mostly a white southern christian thing uh, they were burning Elvis Presley records. In the 1960s, they were burning Beatles records. In the 1970s, they were freaking out against about Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and Judas Priest. In the 1980s, there was a whole bunch of different things that people were worried about. And that continues today. It, it's, it has always been this way, and it will probably always be this way. Um, simply because of everything that I've said so far. Okay, we're going to stop right there for now. A great discussion thus far. That was part one of my talk with Alan Cross, the ongoing history of new music podcast host, and a journal of musical things.com is his website. We do continue later on this episode and what he has to say about the validity of a returning satanic panic in regards to what we've already seen in the past. Well, it may be as bad or even worse than you might think, and also much easier than you might even realize. Don't go anywhere. We got news of the week coming right up on the Metal Robot Podcast. This week's Metal News Recap is brought to you by My Sanity. Everything is so depressing! Why? To stay up to date with the latest in the metal scene, check out TheMetalRobot.com for videos, reviews, press, and so much more. Now, back into the podcast. Presented by TheMetalRobot.com, this is MRP News. All right, welcome into the news segment. I think for the first time on this show, the news recap has only fun stuff. Seriously, no one got hurt in some drama. There's no political bullshit that took place. No potential conspiratorial nut jobs creating problems for metalheads, as far as I found at least. It's an overall decent metal news recap. So let's not waste too long. Let's get to the first story. Um, uh, I found this while trying to get outfit ideas. Um, it's an official Amazon link. Um, um... Who's going to tell them? Yes, in fact, I do think we should tell them what you're laughing about. If you have no idea, Motley Crue, a band we seem to have a lot of experience talking about on this show, no particular reason, have a documentary made about them by Monarch Films. It's available for purchase, too. It's a 45-minute documentary, and you can get it on Amazon and other places to even rent. Though, when you find it, you might notice a few things, as the woman did in that TikTok. Because on the film's cover is a photo of, very much, not Motley Crue. (laughs) Yes, some poor, probably underpaid graphic designer saw a picture of modern-day Steel Panther and thought, yeah, that looks like Motley Crue from back in the day, and slapped it on the cover. Also, on top of that, the website misspelled the crew in Motley Crue. This first made waves thanks to Steel Panther frontman Michael Starr, who posted that TikTok onto his Instagram. To be fair, as Metal Sucks pointed out, they appeared to mostly be a distributor and probably didn't actually make the film itself. But what makes this so funny is how absolutely not Motley Crue they are. Look up any photo of Motley Crue today and back then as well, 
and you'll quickly be able to fill in the blanks. Though maybe not for these guys, because if you look at the cover of the documentary, you can see they even included modern day Motley Crue on the top. They're right above Steel Panther. How do you fuck up that bad? <laughs> Steel Panther is obviously having a laugh about the subject. I'm not entirely sure about Motley Crue as of right now, but they are taking part in the theme song for a uh, an upcoming horror movie called The Retaliators with From Ashes to New, Asking Alexandria, and Ice Nine Kills. So yeah, they may be a bit too busy to worry about this. Then, and I didn't expect this to happen, news, apparently the internet is thirsting over metalheads like never before. I don't know how to feel about that. Uh, first of all, a lot of us metalheads are introverts, so we already don't know the answer to the question, why do people? And second, we're metalheads. The usual first reaction to the normie seeing us is, oh my god, run away, run away, run away. It's usually not to turn into Pepe Le Pew upon first sighting. I am Pepe Le Pew, your lover. Ooh. So what's the difference? Well, I'll give you a hint. No, not the Illuminati. It's not. Actually, that would explain. No, no, no. no it's this. Yep, it turns out Eddie Munson has not only brought Metallica's Master of Puppets back to the charts, but has also made metalheads look sexy and not scary anymore. Well, more specifically, Eddie Munson in general. He's become a trend on TikTok as of late, with fans making shrine videos in tribute to the fallen metalhead. And it's popular too. According to Metal Hammer, because I don't have TikTok and refuse to get it, they report that the hashtag Eddie Munson has over 11 billion views on the app alone. Also, another hashtag, Eddie Munson Edit, has also garnered 1.6 billion views. Also, the related hashtag, Eddie Munson POV series, has 16 million views. One of them is a compilation of actual home videos of Eddie Van Halen with his son Wolfgang when he was a baby. It's really adorable, actually. It actually is really cute. Though, as Metal Hammer pointed out, the internet, being the internet, couldn't help but get weird. Quote, posts are now also emerging, featuring photos and videos of real-life metalheads as shared by Munson acolytes, apparently gagging to brag themselves their own equivalent of Joseph Quinn's iconic character. The article going on to mention that some of those posts appear to be getting shared without the person's consent, which is just really creepy. And while the newfound love from the normies is a nice change of pace, as some note, it's a bit hypocritical. One TikToker named Necrohell saying, quote, people be like, Eddie Munson is so hot, yet still shout goff at me in the streets, which is a very true point. So I'm curious to know your thoughts. Are you for this trend? Do you think it's weird? Or do you wish people wouldn't be so hypocritical about it? I'd love to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts. Hey, you know what? Let's keep that Stranger Things news going. What do you think about Master of Puppets and the resurgence and the fact that it is now, like, number 35 on the Billboard? And it's I mean, kind of, uh, that whole thing is such a mindfuck. Uh, hey, 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 oh, oh, no swearing on the air, Mr. Ulrich. You're on the radio. Kids could be listening. <laughs> <laughs> what kids? That's Lars Ulrich speaking to Walt of Chicago's Rock 95.5 about the surge in popularity of Master of Puppets thanks to Stranger Things. And Walt is absolutely right. Since Eddie smashed his performance out of the park in the Upside Down in the season 4 finale, the song, after 36 years of release, has cracked Spotify's top 50 and received over 17 million Spotify downloads and counting, plus entering the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart for the first time. And that's not even counting all the places it's charting, as Lars explains while continuing to express how insane this whole thing is. The way this thing is taken off, and who would have thought that, uh, what is it, 36 years, yeah. uh, so this song is 36 years old, and is now uh, in the top 40 in like the UK and uh, uh, And it's an eight US. minute song in 2020. Yeah, it's an eight minute song. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. An eight minute song going viral in 2022 just doesn't happen. So the fact that it happened at all is dumbfounding and yet is a good sign for the future of the metal community. Obviously, um, any opportunity you get to turn uh, new uh, kids or, or younger kids onto um, to music that may be a gateway into, um, to, you know, discovering whatever it is, whether it's harder rock or different things or whatever that then was on their radar is super cool. It's at this point we hear the gatekeepers come out of the woodwork going, yeah! but uh, it's pretty cool indeed if you ask me. 
Also, I just like the fact that in this same video from the full interview, they talked about Metallica uh, doing uh, being prolific with charity work, which I know isn't really news, but come on. They have a video in which they talk about charity work, but nah, it's the Stranger Things part people are talking about. Yeah, charity work is nice and all, but what do they think of Stranger Things? <laughs> But keeping a theme going for a little longer, we can now confirm that Metallica is the most successful metal touring act over the past 40 years. This according to Polestar, who released a couple of charts that tracks the total box office gross income as well as the gross amount of income related to ticket sales. This list tracks artists from all genres, which is why you'll find acts like Harry Styles at 150th place, the bottom of the list where he belongs, and even Kanye West higher up at 114th. I rescind my last part, that should have been way lower. But unsurprisingly, when you have such a long span of time, the older artists of rock and metal reign supreme. In fact, while Metallica is only at 9th place on the list for box office gross with $1.219 billion, they're the highest in terms of every metal band on this list. Yeah, they're higher than Guns N' Roses at 23, Neil Diamond at 30, Iron Maiden at 44, Scorpions at 99, Tool at 100, you, you get the point. But even on the other graph showing number of tickets sold, Metallica at 6th place with over 19 million tickets sold is still the most tickets sold for a metal band. In case you're wondering, U2 tops that list with over 26 million tickets, and the Rolling Stones dominate box office gross with $2.165 billion. No surprises there, even if age and length of career have a part in those numbers, one thing is for sure is that rock and metal are still on top. And finally, it looks like Lamb of God seemed to be having a bit of a lineup shuffle, at least temporarily. The band has hit the road for the European tour and with them is Phil Demmel of Violence, who's filling in for usual guitarist Willie Adler. The news came earlier this week on Phil's Instagram and it stirred a few nests along the way as up until that point we haven't heard any reason why that was happening and why Willie wasn't joining the band. Well, a few days later, a statement was made by Willie on the band's Twitter, calming fans all over. Quote, I've got some things that I need to be home for, and I appreciate the band supporting my decision. Going on to say he'll be back on stage for the band's Omens tour in September and October. Omens, of course, referring to the new album due out October 7th. Which is good to hear, I'm glad that Willie is still a part of the band. We do not want another Adler leaving the band. The band's tour is continuing, and you can find the various tour dates and where they'll be playing in the podcast description. And that's it for this week's Metal News Recap. There were quite a few stories I did leave out, but when it comes to this segment of the podcast, while I do try to include the bigger important stories from the week, I like to make sure I grab stories that I can talk about and am interested in enough to write some dumb shit relating to it. But if you think there's a story I should have covered, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that on my socials or even through my email. And of course, any stories that you want me to cover throughout the week, let me know, send me a link, shoot me a message, whatever tickles your fancy in that regard. We'll be back in a moment with Alan Cross continuing our talk about the satanic panic. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. Metal addicts call it symbiosis between extreme metal and classical music. Cult Metal Flick says cinematic landscapes collide with atmosphere. Tom McKay says it's the reason my veins are filled with caffeine. Wait, what? I can't help it. I'd rather write awesome metal than sleep. Give me a fucking ambient, please! Call to the Demon Sultan is out now on all streaming platforms. And while you're at it, pick up some cool merch by going to metalrobotreviews.creatorspring.com or check the links in the podcast description. Stream now. The X-Men of New Orleans is back. No, no, wait, I meant in metal with a new song from Dust Prophet. Could you not have led with that? Sure, but then you wouldn't have done the contractually obligated scream that I can now use for exciting purposes. Watch, Dust Prophet have a new song. <laughs> Here's another one. The tent broke off, so they're giving away free beer to everyone. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. When the axe falls, new fuzzed out jam from the New Hampshire Fuzz Rockers Dust Prophet. Available on Bandcamp. Link down in the podcast description. You're listening to NRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. 
Welcome back. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. We are back with Alan Cross of the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast. And last we had him on was uh, earlier in the podcast, and we talked quite a bit about the Satanic Panic history and also uh, where it's still happening in the world today over towards the eastern side of the map. And even though uh, it's more directed towards the eastern side, as we have discussed already, there is still a possibility and the threat that it could return in North America. And it's pretty simple why, as we will talk about coming up in a couple seconds. So here we go. This is Alan Cross Part 2 on the Metal Robot Podcast. Do you think a side effect of this sort of satanic panic has uh, resulted in a boost in popularity with rock and metal? In some well, I form. think there are some people that are attracted to it. Oh, ooh, this is forbidden. Ooh, this is going to annoy my parents. Ooh, <laughs> this is against uh, the teachings of uh, this church I was forced to attend. Okay, I'm in. And, you know, but it doesn't have to be metal. It doesn't have to be goth. It doesn't have to be any of those sorts of things. It just has to be rebellious music of mm-hmm. some sort. Maybe it's, you know, even pop music that involves a little bit of uh, suggestive sexuality. You know, anything... See, that's, that's the whole thing about you know, music is always driven by the, the attitudes of youth. And yeah, being young means you want to rebel and you just mm-hmm. find your various outlets. And some, you know, for some people, for me, for example, when I was growing up, I was, you know, super hard rock. I mean, that was my thing. You know, the louder, the more uh, anti-establishment, the, you know, the better. And uh, then punk came along and was like, okay, that's even more extreme. So I'm into that. And then... I discovered industrial music. I discovered goth music. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I mean, these people are real outsiders. They're celebrating their outsiderness. They're they're celebrating the fact that they're different and they want to be different. Mm-hmm. And uh, they don't care. They they just don't care. Uh, and, and I found uh, that to be very powerful and empowering. One of the things that these satanic panic people uh, really miss out on is the fact that there are study, there's study after study after study saying that Metal fans are some of the most well-adjusted and happiest people on the planet because they have an outlet for some of their aggression, some of their depression, some of their their angst, uh, and because they have found a community, people who are just like them, who feel and think just like them. And when you have uh, an ability to, to, you know, exercise all these demons inside you, no pun intended here, and to find <laughs> people who are just like you, who think you know, who, who believe in the same things that you do, mm. you end up being pretty well adjusted. I've got family, I got friends, I got music, I got entertainment. I'm good. Yeah. And that's kind of like why I uh, like usually scoff at uh, people when they start attributing, you know, a, a kind of off the satanic panic path here with uh, mass shootings. Whenever someone try, uh, be, is able to attribute it to video games or in some cases to metal, like the Columbine. Uh, oh yeah, the whole Marilyn Manson thing with Columbine. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, listen, correlation does not mean causation. No. So just because you're listening to a particular type of music does not mean that you're going to go shoot up a school or a, a shopping center or a grocery store. It, yeah. it doesn't mean, it, you've got bigger problems than the music that you're listening to. It, it, it may be the, who knows? I mean, there may be, no, I'm, I'll, I'll amend that. There <laughs> are probably thousands of people who might have committed some sort of terrible atrocity had they not had the outlet of, of music and they got all their aggression out and found all their solace in and found all their support in music. And as a result, they didn't go violent. They didn't go weird. So uh, there's no, there's never any. Well, I mentioned some of the studies that that we talked about, uh, you know, with, with metal fans being mm-hmm. well adjusted. So you know, you can't have it both ways. No, it doesn't work that way. Let's get into this one. This is more hypothetical, although it could possibly be true. I have no idea. Uh, people claim there's a connection between the Satanic Panic of the '80s and beyond in history and modern day QAnon, which I don't think is too far off given the shit they're known for. Plus, as you've talked about on your website, the astral world and soul snatching stuff claims. Is that connection claim legitimate? What's the potential of QAnon being a reincarnation of this satanic panic? Well, here's the thing about QAnon. People are looking for explanations as to why the world is the way it is. It can't just be this way because of happenstance, chance, circumstance. There has to be some sort of cabal 
the Illuminati, mm-hmm. some powerful hidden group that are pulling the strings that are abs- that are influencing our lives and making lives terrible for us and, and you know, harvesting children for their adrenochrome and, you know, all that sort of nonsense. So uh, I think QAnon is actually a, a, an outgrowth of the sort of conspirator- conspiratorial thinking that has been with us for, for many, many years. It's just gotten worse thanks to social media and the internet and people living in their echo chambers who will um, latch on to any particular tiny little bit of evidence that supports their claims and then spin it out of control. So mm-hmm. this um, the culture that spawned QAnon, the way of thinking that spawned QAnon has been around for a long time. The problem is that it's now kind of out of control and getting dangerous where you have people believing things that have them try to overturn fair and free elections. So uh, I, I haven't seen, and I, again, if, if mm-hmm. somebody knows anything about this, please tell me, I haven't seen any direct connections between QAnon and, and music, uh, but I'm sure they're there. I'm sure somebody oh, sure. will find something there. And, and we're not talking about, you know, people like, um, I don't know, Ted Nugent or, or Kid Rock uh, <laughs> trying to spin their own theories about, uh, you know, vaccines and, and, and overturned elect or, and, and fake electors and, and uh, f- mm-hmm. fraudulent elections. It hasn't bubbled up to my attention. And if it's there, I want to hear about it. Oh, I do too. Cause that could be uh potentially uh, especially with, uh, QAnon's prominence, especially in the States, I think that could actually spiral out if it be, if it is another incarnation of the satanic panic, which brings me to the main question. There's talk recently as why we're talking about this on Twitter, uh, of a possible return, a satanic panic 2.0, as some people have called it, people wanting to bring it back from the eighties, uh, and have it the similar way that we've seen it. Do you think this is a possibility or are we already in the midst of it? I think it is a real possibility. I think we're starting to see it grow. And again, that's because the United States is fracturing into this partisan, polarized, uh, weird sort of situation where we have a lot of us against them in, mm-hmm. in the U.S. And people, there, there's this this faction in the United States that believes that the world needs to return to the good old Christian values of some time. We don't really sure what, not sure what it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you watch the news and you can't help but think that the, that America is, is turning into this, you know, white nationalist Christian theocracy. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's a pretty, um, hyperbolic statement but it's it's it you do see it happening Mm -hmm. and um if you follow what some of the you you hear in some of the evangelical churches for example uh you're starting to see this more talk of the end times and the second coming and um you know prophecies in the book of revelations Mm -hmm. Uh, you know donald trump being sent by god you know all this sort of stuff once you start seeing that kind of talk it's the idea of, of of a satanic panic can't be far behind and uh i it's it's just a matter of time before i think we we start seeing some of these preachers really go to town mm-hmm. you know uh, and, and cherry picking incidents of of bands uh and songs and behaviors of fans to prove their point when we all know that every music scene has its weird corners and, you know, country music, opera, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they all have their weird corners. So to cherry pick these situations to support an already tenuous position on music, uh, and Satan is, uh, it's just a matter of time. And do you think it'll look different from back then? Uh, do you think social media has played a part in this, or do you think it will play a part in this? Will it look different from before? Yeah, it will be. I think it'll be much. I think it'll blow up a lot more. I think it'll, the the uh, the theories will be a lot more convoluted. I think that uh, you know, thanks to Facebook and Twitter and all the other social media platforms, uh, it will spread much faster. 
Uh, and again, it's a disinformation problem. That is the one of the one of the terrible side effects of social media is the spread of disinformation and conspiracy theory. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure if we were just to open up a browser right now and uh, type in "Satanic Panic 2022," we would find a ton of articles where people are are already uh, have jumped on this bandwagon. And I'm not really sure what their their end game is to. Uh, to convert people, to raise money, to uh, expose these bands so that they go away. I'm not entirely sure. But again, if you, uh, you know, if, if there's, if there are problems in society, one of the things that you really need is the other, someone mm-hmm. to blame stuff on. And music has always been a very convenient other target. So as things get weirder in America, I think you're going to see the emergence of plenty of others. And I think uh, metal may just come back into the crosshairs. I do have one more question that I do want to bring up. Uh, this was actually uh, asked by my co-producer who wanted uh, my co-producer, Anna, who wanted to know if like if Satanic Panic 2.0 does return, is there a way people can help their friends who may be targeted? Now, I know you're not a lawyer. Actually, maybe you are. I have to look at my the, the no. 20 page resume. Uh, okay. So, but, uh, but what do you think people can do if we see this huge resurgence similar to what we saw previously? Again, it's about community. Metal fans stick together. I mean, if you've ever been to a show, mm-hmm. you'll know that the amount of mutual support and admiration amongst the people in the crowd is huge. So metal fans are not uh, strangers to having to band together to fight back against, you know, uh, some sort of weird conservative status quo. I think that's one of the things that uh, that that metal fans, goth fans, industrial fans, alternative music fans are very good at. So that's the first thing. Second thing is don't take the bait. Only you know fight back if you're attacked. You know don't take the bait because that's exactly what they want from you. They want mm-hmm. you to get upset. They want you to you know you'll do something, say something, post something that they will take completely out of context and turn it into something against you. So be very careful, but be aware of what, what's happening, what people think of your community, and if necessary, you know, band together and defend it, because we all know metal and goth and all the, you know, the darker music, the harder music, the heavier music, um, some of the nicest people on the planet so love that stuff. Well, Alan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Anything you want to promote to the listenership of the Metal Robot Podcast, now is the time. You have the floor, good sir. I uh, have a children's book. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Science of Song. It's all about the uh, intersection of science and music. It's good for any kid between the ages of 8 and 12. That's pretty cool. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Oh, you're very welcome. All right, that was Alan Cross at Journal of Musical Things.com, the ongoing history of new music podcast and all the things. Go check him out. Links to everything down in the podcast description. Highly recommend checking out his stuff. The guy really knows his shit. This is the Metal Robot Podcast. You just listened to MRP, the Metal Robot Podcast. The Reign of Fire is upon us. Let's wrap this up with what's coming up in the next episode. Kevin Gilfeather, solo musician and artist doing some fun punk psych something stuff. And he'll be joining us next week to talk about his new album, Armchair Revolutionaries. Also, Antivistia has a new t-shirt campaign that is fucking genius. I'm still working on getting them on the show, but if it all works out, that is what we will have next time. In the meantime, though, thanks for listening to the Metal Robot Podcast. You can follow the show on the internet, YouTube, Metal Robot Reviews, Facebook and Twitter at the Metal Robot, Instagram, at the dot metal robot you can also check out everything metal robot on the metal robot.com for videos podcasts press and so much more special thanks to alan cross for coming on the show sharing his insight to sam astaroth demon core is available in the podcast description and to co-producer anna great work as always i'm tom mckay if you enjoyed this episode and you want more be sure to subscribe wherever you get your favorite podcasts i'll see you in the mosh pit next time have a good night